Thank you so much for joining us here for another webinar for the 2023 Carbon Removal Challenge. I'm Matt Parker, uh, one of the co-founders of the Open Air Collective, and we're very lucky to be joined again by Grant Faber, uh, who's going to be doing another really good uh, session that's going to help get people up to speed on how carbon removal is sort of going through the world. Uh, this one specifically is about life cycle and techno-economic assessment, uh, something that is very near and dear to Grant's heart uh, and something that he does on a daily basis as part of his consulting firm, Carbon Based Consulting. Uh, so Grant, um, oh, before I turn it over to you, Grant, I'm just gonna quickly share screen here to show our upcoming uh, webinars that we've got coming up. So uh, if you are enjoying our content and want to see more of it coming forward, we've got a whole bunch more sessions coming. We've got recordings of previous sessions uh, that are coming up. We're going to add the recording of this session when we're done, but please make sure to uh, put the upcoming sessions on. We have hardware design office hours, scalability, fundraising, a lot of great sessions. We're going to uh, probably be adding a few more sessions to this as well going on throughout the challenge. So please check out our website, get on our mailing list if you're not already on the mailing list, uh, which most of you, if you're in the session, should be already. Um, and uh, come work with us in open air, join our Discord, uh, whatever we can do to help support you uh, moving forward in the carbon removal sector. We want to help you with that, especially those of you who are students who may be looking to work in this uh, after graduation or while you're still in school. Uh, so with that, I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to turn it over to Grant uh, to talk about life cycle and techno-economic assessment. Cool. Thank you very much for the intro, Matt. And yeah, thanks for having me back this week to talk about this. Like you said, it's a very near and dear topic, one that I work on more or less every day. So yeah, excited to talk about it and yeah, hopefully have some discussion at the end. So yep, it says my screen is sharing here. So um, I'll share this and if there's any issues, you know, just, um, I can see it, Grant. So I think you're good oh, to go. Sounds good. Yeah. So yeah. Um, for a favor, yeah. Carbon-based consulting, like I mentioned, um, I put this cool picture on the side. Uh, I was playing with, uh, Dolly, uh, from open AI just to generate some stuff. And I was just tinkering around with it the other day, trying to do some various carbon removal related prompts. And this was the image I came up with when I just typed in economic and environmental sustainability. Um, it was kind of cool. So I figured, eh, I'll put it in here. Maybe it will provide some flavor before we start the presentation. I thought it was kind of cool. So have you ever wondered, how do we really know that solar is better than coal, all things considered throughout its whole life cycle? How do we know a product or process's holistic impact on the environment? And how do, do we estimate the expected costs of emerging clean tech. So how do we even really know that, oh, these projections, you know, solar will be the cheapest energy source and wind is going to fall in price. Yep. How do we know all of these things? So the way that we do that is through techno-economic assessment, life cycle assessment. Uh, their uh, initialisms are TEA and LCA. And they can really help with those questions that I just covered on the previous slide, but they really are meant to help with a lot of these different goals that are outlined here, as well as other goals that we can talk about throughout the presentation as well. So one of the most important aspects of these methodologies is the calculation of cost and emissions drivers for merging processes uh, or even existing processes. So when you go through these established methodologies and you assess some kind of technology that's resulting in the creation of, of some product, for example, you will end up with these results that say, these are all the, the contributors, the cost of this good uh, or this technology. And then here's how they stack up relative to one another. And then essentially you have the same uh, kind of breakdown for the emissions as well. So the example in the bottom there is that electricity causes 45% of process emissions. And so that could apply to say a carbon removal process that uses electricity, but maybe that uses other raw materials as well has some emissions associated with its equipment that's used in that process. But after doing a life cycle assessment, you'll be able to say, oh, electricity causes this much, you know, maybe with some margin of error due to uncertainty that's in that study, but at least you'll get a sense 
possibly in an order of magnitude sense, but hopefully a little higher resolution than that. So you can get a sense of what's, what's contributing to this. And then also as a technologist or an inventor or someone who's commercializing a technology, what are the things we need to do to effectively reduce the emissions associated with that process? Or if you're doing TEA and thinking about cost, what can we do to effectively reduce the cost of that process? Relatedly, there's an aspect of targets. So many times, when we're deploying a new clean technology, for example, it will be competing with some kind of conventional technology. Maybe you're making sustainable jet fuel and you want it to be cost competitive with conventional jet fuel. And so often new technologies are much more expensive because they haven't been optimized yet. They still need a lot of uh, research breakthroughs. They might be operating at a very small scale. And so conducting a techno-economic assessment can help you understand what's the gap between where we are now or where we would be if we were to build a whole plant using a particular new innovative process and where we want to be ideally so that we can have this product be cost competitive in the market. In the carbon removal world, it, we're not necessarily always making some kind of product. Often the goal with carbon removal is to take CO2 from the atmosphere or the ocean and sequester it somewhere permanently. And the product, kind of like we talked about in the webinar last week about with the different business models for carbon removal. Um, the, the, the product is often that voluntary offset. And so because of that, you don't, it, it's harder to say that there's a conventional thing that you're competing with necessarily. However, there are some standards. Many people want to hit this $100 per ton benchmark. I believe this is the benchmark set out by the Department of Energy's carbon negative shot as well. They hope to have permanent carbon removal at $100 per ton of CO2 net removed from the atmosphere by 2030. So again, TEA helps with figuring out, well, what needs to be true? What do we need to do as inventors so that we can hit that cost target? Next, there's this, again, sort of related goal of stakeholder requirements. And so maybe a company is seeking investment into their technology, or maybe you're trying to justify to the Department of Energy why your team should get more funding so that you can scale up your solution. Often these funders will be interested in studies like TEA and LCA so that they can understand, does this product have wings? Does it have potential? Is it possible that this will work or is it just totally unlikely and we should maybe invest our funds elsewhere if our goal is to pursue and create this optimal portfolio of carbon removal solutions. So increasingly, there are specific stakeholders in the carbon removal community asking teams to submit LCA and TEA related materials when they're applying for some kind of funding or investment. You see this with Stripes carbon removal procurement. You see it with Frontier. You see it with XPRIZE. You see it with Brink. Um, it's increasingly common. And so it really behooves teams to investigate and have a good understanding of these studies and, and to ultimately conduct these, these assessments for their technology to help with meeting those requirements of certain stakeholders. For this final point here, dialogue, this is a, you could argue maybe a bit more of an intangible benefit of doing these studies. But often when you conduct a TA or an LCA, you start asking questions, you start thinking about things that if you weren't systematically walking through the steps of these assessments, you may not have thought about otherwise. And so that's kind of one of the big benefits of doing this process is it just starts a conversation among the founders of a team or the inventors of a technology or different departments even, if it's a, say a startup that's growing. And it gets people just thinking about, man, you, you know, we need to plan for using renewable electricity for this process, but it's might maybe not totally clear, or, oh, we need to purchase at least at this scale or operate at least at this scale if we want to hit this cost target. And it just facilitates some of that business planning that is necessary to really scale these technologies from an idea into something that exists at a serious, mature commercial level. So I do have a small note here on the bottom that LCA, life cycle assessment, it often and kind of technically refers to looking at not just all the 
life cycle stages of a product all the way from raw materials acquisition through to end of life. But it often looks at more than just greenhouse gas emissions. It might look at particulate matter formation, smog, acidification, eutrophication or contribution to algae blooms, resource use and so on. However, many people tend to think that climate change is our most pressing environmental issue. And so many people tend to focus on the greenhouse gas emissions aspects of a process. I've heard from some corporate practitioners before that some of the other impacts like particulate matter formation are heavily regulated, whereas at least 20 years ago or so, um, it really kind of now in, in many respects, uh, greenhouse gases aren't as regulated. So, so that's the one that people are interested in trying to measure precisely and control because the other things are already kind of measured and controlled from certain and regulated for, uh, for, for certain impact categories. However, it's, it's tricky because you don't want to get so-called carbon tunnel vision and only focus on CO2 at the cost of considering all these other important aspects and dimensions of a given process, a given technology, or in our case, a given carbon removal pathway or technology. However, there's really a strong emphasis on the greenhouse gas emissions aspect of these studies. Most LCAs or assessments, they'll definitely cover emissions. They won't necessarily cover these other impact categories. For carbon removal, it's also particularly important because if you're not net removing carbon, then the process is pointless. And so it makes sense to uh, kind of use that as, as a stage gate or so to say, okay, are we actually removing carbon? Under what conditions are we actually removing carbon? And then you can consider the other impacts associated with the process. So Fortunately, there is a standard approach for doing these studies. This general approach comes from the ISO 14040 and 14044 guidelines for conducting life cycle assessment. And then the Global CO2 Initiative created uh, what I've quoted on the bottom here, the Techno-Economic Assessment Life Cycle Assessment Guidelines for CO2 Utilization Technologies in particular, which I often use for carbon removal tech, even though it's a distinct category. But the Global CO2 Initiative has adapted that ISO framework, and they've applied it to not only LCA, but TEA as well. And so this, these steps listed here are how one walks through an actual study. And I wanted to show these for some context so that it's clear what actually goes into these assessments and how a practitioner actually walks through it. And this, when I conduct assessments as part of my consulting work, I walk through every single one of these steps for every study. It's just, it's, it's just how it's done. It's, it's just a part of it. So the first one is goal. You set the purpose. Why are you doing that study? What questions are you trying to answer? Then you set the scope of the study. What are the things that you are considering? What are the things you're not considering? This can somewhat be controversial. If the study is being used for public communication, you don't want to maybe exclude certain things that people might expect would be included upon reporting final results. But sometimes for internal purposes, it might make sense to exclude certain things that would just distract from the goal of the study. And so you set that scope, you figure out what indicators, or metrics you're trying to calculate from this process that will help you meet the goal of the study. Next is the inventory. So the, the inventory is the actual data collection that goes into a study. Here, you're getting all the data you need about your process, about material flows, energy flows, waste generation, any pollution that's created from different steps, the labor that's required, the equipment, the land, so forth. You gather as much data as you possibly can in order to make the calculations that you need to make in order to meet the goal of that study. The next step, this in TEA, it's called calculation of indicators. In LCA, it's called life cycle impact assessment. This is where you're actually calculating those metrics. So you're synthesizing all that inventory data, and then you're calculating something like cost per unit or, as I've outlined here, emissions per unit. As I believe I talk about a little later in the presentation, these are very, very common metrics that people are trying to calculate for various reasons. So there are many other metrics that you can calculate, but these are very, very common ones. Then there's this iterative overarching interpretation step where you're always thinking as you're doing the study, do I have the data that's necessary to do the calculations I need to do to meet the goal of the study? 
is the study going as I thought it, it would go? Conducting this uncertainty analysis and saying, okay, given the uncertainty I have with this data, can I actually make the claims that I'm making about the final results? And then also finally making potentially recommendations if that's part of the goal of the study and saying, well, maybe we need to use a different energy source or different energy mix or different material or need to adjust transportation or something along those lines, some kind of ideally actionable recommendation that you can give to a particular process. I guess now is a good time to note as well that often TEA and LCA, they are conducted in an academic setting when scholars are trying to understand potential impacts of a new process or they're trying to study environmental impacts of an existing process that maybe hasn't been studied before. But increasingly, these methodologies are being deployed for commercialization of new technologies as well. Because of the goals I talked about on the previous slide, it's very useful for new like hard tech or uh, specifically climate tech companies to have this understanding so that they can guide their business in its formative stages. So the final step here is, is just this reporting that depends on the commission of the study and, and their goals. You could make just an Excel model to present, it could be a report, could be a slide deck, anything like that where you are communicating the ultimate results of the study. Ideally too, over time, you might update a study as new data becomes available or some scholars do like a meta-analysis where they take many different LCA or TEA studies and then look at the results from all of them and try to synthesize results and see are there any common trends. And that can be a very useful practice as well for getting closer to something that looks like truth for the environmental and economic aspects of, of a process. So to give a little bit more context about what TA is and what goes into it and where it falls. So TA kind of exists in this middle category here between a very basic materials and process model. It also says here, a bill of materials. Um, that, that, that's sort of a common expression that's, that's used when you're just considering the raw materials that go into a process and saying, okay, if we wanna make X product, we're gonna need Y and Z raw materials. And so you just, count, you, you just multiply the amount of those raw materials that you need by the corresponding cost, then you get just a, uh, this very non-detailed, but kind of floor uh, of a variable cost. And on the other end, you have this full business financial model. So this is what a business might create for an entire project, uh, an entire like project finance model, where they're thinking about the investment that goes into it and the taxes and the depreciation and the overhead and all these like business level things, all these uh, parameters or factors that are important for determining pricing and the price you should actually charge for a given product or process is in the case of carbon removal. But there is this intermediate step, this so-called production or operation cost model, also, as I note on the right, called a manufacturing or technical cost model. And that's the model that's kind of the core engine of a techno-economic assessment. And there you get a little more complicated than, than, than just that basic materials list. As it notes, you add in things like uh, labor, energy use, equipment. You might add in land and scrap rates, and you might have different equations relating different parameters within that study. And you're really trying to determine um, like the cost of of that process, but from a more technical perspective. And it's more advanced, like I said, than the bill of materials. And you're really trying to get a sense of what are the key technical contributors uh, to a given cost value. And the reason that you even have this intermediate is because you want a more detailed model, but you may not necessarily be to the stage of doing that kind of full business financial model. Also, some of the things that exist in that full financial model aren't as controllable by a startup. So if you're a startup, you're trying to commercialize some new process, it might not be the case that you have as much control or that there's much that you can do about the corporate tax rate, or something like that. That's just inevitability that you'll ultimately have to handle as a business. 
uh, when you're considering how much tax will we pay and how much will we need to return to investors and so forth. But you can maybe choose to uh, direct your, your research and development in a way where you can say, well, do we use more expensive equipment that makes the process more energy efficient? Or do we use less expensive equipment uh, that's less energy efficient, so then you have to pay for more energy? So you might have this kind of equipment and energy trade-off that you're facing. And this intermediate model can help you really hone in on those important factors and decide, well, which should we focus our resources on if our ultimate goal is trying to minimize the cost that we have to pay or the, the cost that we have to incur to uh, do this process or manufacture this product. So it kind of falls in the middle and, and hopefully this gives you a bit of a sense of the kinds of things that are going into one of these models. LCA, on the other hand, kind of has a different mapping or, or different uh, structure that you can use to think about it. Ultimately, interestingly, the kinds of inputs that you need for both studies are very similar. Often you'll start with this kind of mass and energy flow or mass and energy balance, and then you'll be applying cost or emissions or other impact factors to the flows in that process. But I generally like to talk about these processes using these two different images because I find that they both just give better context uh, to, or better context about what these processes are. So here, this shows the entire life cycle of a given product. So you see this raw materials acquisition, that's the first step. And then you have this processing step, and then there's manufacturing. So when you're actually creating the good that will be used in the use phase, and then there's this end of life step. Then you may notice there's different ways that something say like an aluminum can, it could technically be re reused, but we don't often reuse it. Uh, is it remanufactured? Uh, not necessarily, it's not necessarily used as a component, it's more recycled, where we're maybe sending that aluminum can back into a material processing, maybe it gets mixed in with virgin aluminum, and then it gets remanufactured and then used again, and then we can keep cycling that. Sometimes though, at the end of life, something just becomes a waste, it just becomes a waste product, winds up in the landfill. Sadly, that's kind of the linear flow that we have with many of our products that we use today. However, like I noted at the bottom here, the kind of high level goal is to eventually move to a fully circular economy. Many of you listening have probably heard this before, oh, circular economy, circular ecosystem and so forth. So the ecosystem that we live in uh, before say industrialization worked in a much more circular way where the sun, and wind and water kind of supplied all the energy and then things were made using largely like natural materials, and then it all got returned specifically before humans uh, ever existed, or at least existed in our current form. Um, nature is much more circular, and now it's more linear where we're exploiting these kind of depletable or non-renewable stocks, and then we're uh, putting just waste, and then it's just accumulating in the environment, and we're degrading earth systems and so forth. It's getting a little bit into that industrial ecology uh, and sustainability studies world, but it's just something interesting to think about, especially in the context of carbon removal, where what we're trying to do is ultimately make things a little more circular. Uh, I thought about before how that's maybe something that's very attractive about carbon removal is that it closes the loop in a sense where we've been emitting all the CO2 and it's just been accumulating in the atmosphere. Clearly that's going to cause some kind of massive problem as it is. And so now it is our obligation to maybe take that back out as the earth does naturally, but over very, very long time scales that aren't as uh, immediately useful to our current civilization uh, and our current goals. And our goal is to make that more circular and kind of contribute to that circularity that we have been violating for so long. But anyway, that's maybe a little cer cer cerebral for a uh, Thursday morning, but this is generally just how to think about an LCA and how it's done. These are the different steps. You have these factors that go in and, and come out of each of these steps and you try to measure these and then apply factors to them to get a sense of you know how, how sustainable is this process. So it's generally better if you can do either of these assessments earlier rather than later. As this diagram shows, you're 
influence over a process drops rapidly as you start actually defining some plant that will be built or some operation that will be deployed. And then the cost also goes up tremendously. So if you can intervene and change a process for the better at this early stage, you'll just have much more influence over that process. You'll be able to alter more features of it. And then it won't be as expensive to try to intervene. But if the plant's already built and already totally defined and it's already operating, it becomes so much harder to try to change things at that point. So the earlier you can do these studies, the better. However, there's a trade-off because you'll have more uncertainty necessarily at these earlier stages. So it is something tricky to, to try to deal with. And you, I, I always try to warn people too, that you don't want to get sucked down this, this path of like making a suboptimal decision because of an imperfect model. And so you, it does pay to, and you should be really careful with conducting these kinds of assessments and trying to interpret their results as well. So I mentioned indicators briefly a little bit earlier in the presentation or these metrics that are used for TEA and LCA. Here are just two huge lists. You don't have to read through these or anything. These are just some examples of different metrics that people might be interested in calculating from these studies. So you can see on the left, there's a lot of things that you might recognize from like an accounting class or chemistry class or something, you know, capex and opex and uh, margins and so forth. And then on the right, you'll recognize some of these phrases from earlier, you know, smog formation, acidification, eutrophication. There's the global warming potential, which is often, as I mentioned, the one that many people are focused on. And you can see all these different units that are used. There are different sets. So on the right here, this is just one type of impact assessment method from LCA called Tracy. Uh, there's other ones out there, recipe, CML. It, there are some impact specific ones. So for water, there's AWARE, for greenhouse gas emissions, there's the IPCC, global warming potentials. So there, there, there's all these different ways to classify these impacts. Again, I think some of these are a little bit more of like scholarly interest or some of these are highly regulated already. And there's just a lot of focus on that global warming, warming potential. And that's what I note on this next slide as well, that when people are doing TEA, they're often really interested in this overall manufacturing cost per unit that's composed of these primary categories, which you'll probably recognize, or you may recognize from the earlier diagram showing the different types of cost models or financial models that are out there. These are often viewed as the primary categories, although of course there's many, many more categories that can be factored in in terms of cost. And then on the LCA side, people are often calculating GHG emissions using a similar set of inputs. And I note on the bottom here why these are so popular. So for the TA, well, you wanna know the manufacturing cost, you can have a sense of how cost competitive that product can be with a conventional product, or if you're doing carbon removal, how compatible is your process with meeting these goals that many people are outlining. And then for LCA, um, you, want to do, you want to calculate that GHG emissions per unit to again, as I mentioned with carbon removal, have a sense of is this actually net removing carbon or not? Or in the case of making any other kind of product, well, does this product actually have lower emissions than its conventional counterpart? And that's important because many new processes that we're deploying, we might be deploying them for the explicit purpose of reducing emissions. And so if they don't reduce emissions, all things considered, well, then you need to reconsider the process. So a note here on this slide is that these methodologies aren't perfect. Maybe I've been hyping them up or something uh, has these magical things throughout the presentation. I hope that's not what I've been doing, but I just wanted to note here on this slide, some things that these, method that these methodologies are not. So this first one is they are not perfect engineering simulations or estimates. So you might create some kind of process flow diagram that features all the mass and energy flows in a given process. You might do some kind of CAD modeling or uh, and something similar to understand what are the dimensions of this equipment 
uh, how, how much raw material do we need to manufacture it? How much goes to waste? Can we reduce that waste, et cetera? You might do all of those kinds of simulations to have an understanding of the actual engineering of, of your process and the actual implementation. But often you'll need to do those first and then that feeds into or informs the LCA and TEA work. Ideally, you don't want the practitioner of these assessments engineering the entire plant. And I can speak from experience, this is something I've had to do, is engineer entire plants in these models, despite not having full information. And there's nothing totally wrong with that, but it does eat into the accuracy and, uh, of, of the assessment. And for someone in my position, I have to assess many, many different kinds of technologies. And there's not, it's not really realistic to expect that I'm this you know, leading expert in every single kind of engineering and every single kind of technology. And so you need specialists to do those kinds of simulations and estimates to have that good understanding of what is actually going on in this process. And then you feed that data into the assessments. This middle one here, so the, the these methodologies are not you know, super rigorous project finance or, or pricing models. As I noted on the previous slide showing the different types of cost and pricing models, there's that kind of full business financial model, which when you're actually operating a business and trying to get investment and trying to price something, that is ultimately where you want to get. And there are also much deeper environmental impact assessments that may be required by federal law when you're deploying a new project. And that might take into account very specific environmental factors for a given location where you're building a plant and you might try to you might want to factor in stuff like disruptions to ecosystems or habitat destruction or uh, disrupting migration patterns of animals that might be unique to that region. All those kinds of things are again a little bit more specific and, and they take place once that project is a little more developed and is actually getting built. TA and LCA are kind of this intermediate. They're this, as I've been touching on throughout the presentation, they're this intermediate between just an idea coming out of a lab and a full project actually being built. But they are this important middle ground so we can understand what we need to do to optimize these technologies, make them more ideal. Then my final point here is they are not 100% accurate. There is a lot of uncertainty that goes into these models. And if that's not disclosed in, in some sense, it's just something to be aware of and, and to look out for. And there's also a huge problem. This is a little bit my personal opinion, but I think there's a huge problem with precision bias in this space and really many spaces that are, there are many methodologies that are trying to project something about the future, where if you have more data, more decimal points, more like fancy visualizations, and interesting, cool, probabilistic and statistical methodologies that you use, just because you use those things doesn't mean it's more accurate. Those things need to be used accurately. And I worry that sometimes people over deploy those things or that if, if you're looking at a study, it might look super complicated and have a bunch of interesting visualizations. It's just easy to assume that it's easy to mistake the precision of that, that study with accuracy. And it's just something important to understand that these studies are not necessarily 100% accurate. And there often is a very large amount of uncertainty because we're trying to do something that's inherently unknown. You know, we're working on future developments. With that said, the models can guide us in the right direction and they can help us explore contingencies. If the process uses X amount of electricity, then it will have Y amount of cost. And that's, that might just be this reality or a truth, but it exists in the form of a contingency. And so TA and LCA can help us explore that. And also as time goes on and we get better and better data for the models, then they improve. And then they're hopefully a little bit more accurate. The time. Now, pivoting to something that's maybe a little less conceptual, Assess CCUS is a website that I helped create when I worked at the Global CO2 Initiative. And it has a lot of detail about LCA and TEA. So if you're looking to learn more about these methodologies, it's, it's a great place to go. There's high level introductions and some more detailed processes about walking through all those steps that I talked about earlier in the presentation. There's a cool calculator in the upper right hand corner that I built that you can uh, tinker with. 
and that's kind of a fun way to learn a little bit more. And there's a lot of databases too. So if you're ever doing an assessment and you're looking for some kind of cost or emissions data of any kind, this is a great place to go to try to find some references for that. And so I think I just have this slide and one following one, and then we will get to questions and discussion. So yeah, please um, remember if you have questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A box or the chat. So many people in the audience will be working on and thinking about carbon dioxide removal. And so there, I just wanted to outline some general tips for CDR projects that might be useful for those in the audience. So just for indicators, often, like I said, people are trying to calculate the cost per ton removed. Something to consider though, is that if you're trying to calculate net removal costs, you'll need that TEA and the LCA results for emissions uh, per unit, because you'll want to understand what's kind of your gross capture cost. So what's your cost of like taking a ton of CO2 from the atmosphere and injecting it you know, permanently underground. But if for each ton you capture, it's say it costs $100. If you emit 0.5 tons, then you need to gr remove two gross tons in order to remove one net ton if you're emitting 0.5 tons for each ton that you emit. And so if it's $100 for gross capture and it's only 50% efficient, then you would divide that $100 by the 50% to get $200 per net ton. And so that's just something to keep in mind when you're trying to calculate net removal costs for a process, which will ultimately serve as the basis for the pricing if you're thinking about ever selling removal offsets. Next, about data. As I think I've touched on, data can be very difficult to find. Sometimes though, or, or sometimes you'll want, you'll basically need to start with your best guesses for things and then just get more accurate over time. So you maybe start with educated guesses and then you might use secondary data from literature and reports. And then maybe ultimately you'll have in a TA, for example, actual vendor quotes. It's ideal if you can get an equipment vendor to say, well, this is how much you're gonna have to pay if you buy this. And that's a great number to be able to use in your model because then it actually represents what you would be paying if you were to do that process and it ceases to be a guess. Regardless, you'll always want to be transparent and defensible. And this applies to way more than TA and LCA. Whenever you're building a model or really even doing a lot of knowledge work, you just wanna be very transparent about the assumptions that you're making and the kind of principles that you're using, and then also defensible. If someone asked, why are you using that data? Why are you using that approach? Could you defend that choice? And if you do those two things, it just makes for for better models and better modeling. And, and it just can give you and others more confidence in your results. Holistic considerations. So costs and emissions are foundation of your business or, or your project or your technology or whatever you might be working on, but they're not the ceiling. So there's many other dimensions of a technology that are important uh, other than just the cost and environmental impact. And really, the lack of consideration of these other factors is why we have many problems in our society. Again, in a little bit my personal opinion, but maybe many businesses only focused on cost and supply and demand in the market or something like that. But if you don't consider the environmental impacts, well, that's maybe why we have so many of the environmental catastrophes that we do. But there's also social impacts from a process, you know, considerations of environmental justice and community, local community engagement and human rights and supply chains are very, very important, not always reflected in the price, or they're definitely not reflected in TA and LCA. You would want to do something else called social LCA, which is its own whole methodology with its own data challenges and approaches and indicators. But that's another huge dimension of a technology that's important to consider that, again, just complicates these decisions for making or for figure, complicates decisions about emerging technologies. There might be temporal issues, maybe it will work, but it will take a long time to have the research breakthroughs necessary. There might be geographical constraints, maybe a process is totally dependent on a certain mineral. And so while it's maybe scalable in all other respects, it's not scalable because that mineral is only available in one location, something to think about. And then, yeah, basically everything else. <laughs> there, there's a lot of different dimensions, a lot of things to consider when creating and commercializing new technologies. And so, yeah, I want to be holistic. And then time, as I mentioned before, 
models should be updated with time is you get more actual data, but it's never too early to start. And it's never too early to start thinking about these things because they are so important for process. So just finally, just a couple final things to note. There's a lot of ways to get help. So if you're interested in learning more about these methodologies, definitely check out AssessCCUS. Like I mentioned, there's a lot of practitioners who work full time on this, um, you know, so, so, such as myself, but there's many other consultants and, and scholars who do this. So if you ever have particular questions, you know, perfect people to ask. And there's also a lot of existing publications. If you're working on a specific process, or if you're curious about something, you can go to Google or Google Scholar, um, maybe increasingly ChatGPT as well, and ask, hey, what are the, or you just, you know, Google like, hey, uh, ethanol, LCA or something, if you're ever curious, and a bunch of things will come up and you can start looking through. And that's a great way to learn a little bit more about the cost and uh, emissions and environmental impacts of a process you might be curious about. If, if it's a totally scaled thing, you know, if you're looking at like light bulbs or something, you're not going to find as many TEAs. Companies building light bulbs have their own cost models. They, they already know all the costs that go into that kind of stuff, but you would find some interesting LCAs on, on different kinds of light bulbs that do ultimately serve as the foundation for a lot of say claims that you might see thrown around in the press or uh, even policies that ultimately get implemented. So yeah, there's a lot of poli or there, there's a lot of publications out there that are very interesting, and it's also just a great way to learn more about these methodologies. So, yeah, thanks for listening. I see we have some questions uh, and some things in the chat, so I will stop sharing. But yeah, thank you for listening. Okay. Actually, can you uh, put that last slide up just for a bit, just so people have a time to look at it a little bit longer so that people can uh, get your information and uh, definitely get in touch with you if you want to. You can also find uh, Grant's LinkedIn on the uh, on the Carbon Removal Challenge page as well if you want to look for it there. But uh, there's, uh, there's some other great ways to, to get in contact with Grant as well. So uh, I'm going to start off with a couple of questions and then we'll get to some of the questions that have come up in the Q&A. So if you have questions, uh, please post them in the Q&A so that I can ask them uh, to Grant. But I did want to start off with, uh, you know, you, you talked about, you know, this isn't 100% accurate that, you know, there's, if you had to say, you know, what, what is sort of the margin of error? I'm sure that like, you know, it's different from project to project, but um, but the, give me a range of like what's the, what's the most accurate to least accurate you've ever been on a, a project where you were trying to uh, uh, do life cycle analysis and uh, take an economic impact. Yeah, it, it really varies. So some processes, there will just be much more inherent uncertainty about where the technology can go. And so there might be a lot of uncertainty about how much energy a process uses or just the how low it can go in terms of say it's variable raw material consumption. Often there are physical limits. Like if a process is violating the laws of physics or something, you just know it's not going to work. And sure. that, so that often sets like a lower bound on, on things where it's like, well, you can't get better than uh, the stoichiometric calculations for, for a given process. So uh, you know, you could argue in a sense that the difference between what you calculate and that theoretical uh, perfect performance is the kind of max uncertainty. Uh, and that will vary depending on, on a process. There are some guidelines from, an organ from a cost engineering organization called AAC International. And they have some recommended practices in terms of uh, the stage, in terms of like what stage a project is at and the level of uncertainty that you might expect based on the level of the project that's been defined. And so I think that in the worst case, it's something like negative 50% to 100%. So it could be 50% cheaper than you calculate or like twice, twice as expensive uh, if you do the, do the cost calculation properly. For LCA, I would say the uncertainty can be even higher. Some, sometimes there's examples of things where like many scholars will do an assessment and that, but then 20 years later, someone will realize, Hey, we missed this totally important thing that totally flips the results of this study on its head. I think that's happening a little bit with ethanol. I mm -hmm. think ethanol in the beginning, it was like, well, it's biofuel, you know, uh, you put ethanol in the tank and then the CO2 that comes out of that is CO2 that originated in the atmosphere because the corn was growing and took it up. And while that's better than petroleum derived carbon, right. But 
people are kind of digging back into it and saying, wait a second, there's all this deforestation we had to do in yeah. order to create the uh, land, like the, to take advantage of the arable land to grow the corn. And then when you're doing corn, you maybe you're using pesticides too. You're using fertilizer that's emissions intensive. Uh, and then there can be even other impacts with introducing monoculture, you know, like genetically modified uh, corn into the environment. So there can be ecosystem impacts. And so I think when you dig back into it, it, it kind of complicates it a little bit. And now there's kinds, of, I've seen that there's some questions, well, is ethanol really better? Now, of course, we have EVs today, which are, have been shown by many, many life cycle assessments to be much better. Um, except in cases we're using 100% coal-fired electricity, but even in those cases, we expect that coal-fired electricity to go down over time. So it's worthwhile deploying EVs now, anticipating that future change in the grid mix. But yeah, there are there can be huge issues, and people might not discover them for a long time. At what point in the process do you feel like it is appropriate to start thinking about like life cycle analysis and uh, you know, the, the, the impact of these things. I feel like, you know, maybe your feeling is like you should start thinking of this right away, but I feel like maybe if you're in very early stage research that you, that might get in the way of certain ideas. If you're like trying to now analyze all these things before you've actually determined uh, how effective your, your, your project is or, or your approach is, do you feel like that's something you should be focusing on from the very start? Something that you're looking at when you're looking to scale up something in between those two, when, when do you think the right time to start really, uh, factoring that into your approach is? So I think many people have to implicitly consider it. So if you're an engineering professor and you're trying to create some new chemical pathway that's lower carbon or something, the LCA is almost in some sense the driving force behind what you're doing, because why would you invest any time or resources in creating a new process that's going to be more expensive because it's not operating at scale, but that's like worse for the climate. Like it's just, it's just not even worthwhile to even go down that path. So often that LCA, at least very high level LCA thinking is kind of that guiding factor to get into something where you, you'll think, well, if we capture the emissions from an ethanol plant and then make them into jet fuel, for instance, well, that's going to be circular carbon. And so that should be better than the petroleum based jet fuel. And you can kind of just reason through that without doing any, even back of the envelope calculations, mm -hmm. you can just kind of sit and think, well, that, I think that should be true. And, and then you can start developing a process, start building it out. And then as you get more data and start thinking about it a little more, then you can investigate. And so, as I mentioned, you know, land use change is, is an important issue with ethanol. And so maybe you'd start to do a literature review and you would come across that issue being identified. And then you might think about it a little more and say, oh, okay, well, is it really possible that this process could do X, Y, or Z? Or you might see someone else say, well, there's kind of this opportunity cost because we could just inject that CO2 underground uh, that we capture from ethanol fermentation that could represent a carbon removal process because that's atmospheric CO2. And so I don't, you, you can kind of start digging into it as you begin developing a technology. But yeah, often that the, the drive to reduce emissions or to save on cost is the factor that's pushing people to develop these new processes anyway. So they're, they're kind of already thinking about it, I, I think. And then, yeah, just as you get more data, you can just do more and more detailed analyses. Do you think that analyses, so I, I think you're right, that the, that's something to consider at the very beginning and often the driver of a lot of these projects. But at a certain point, it feels like you need to have somebody independent uh, looking at it. Do you feel like that's a necessary part of, you know, when you're ready to scale up to a business or seek funding or something like that to have an external evaluator look at the sort of this, these assessments to make sure that uh, you have independent verification of, of what you're looking at? Well, I'm very biased because that's the business <laughs> that I offer. Yeah. I so. mean, a little bit of a softball for you, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I will say that often with something like a TEA in particular, if you're a new business, a new startup, if your TEA doesn't make sense, you won't be able to function in the market. You know, you might be able to hype your technology up, raise a bunch of funding, get people excited about it. But when it actually comes time to get paid and to write checks to pay your bills on a very like large scale, you won't be able to do that if your 
if you don't have a good cost profile. And so because of that, unless you're Theranos, you have a very straight, and really even if you are Theranos, you have a very strong incentive to do the TEA properly, just so you can understand if your process can actually go anywhere. And so in that sense, you can, I mean, a lot of people might want to lie to themselves or whatever, or they fall into different traps. Often there, there are like a lot of existing resources out there and people often want to do the TEA properly. Why they might hire someone like myself is because they don't want to spend their time doing it. Mm. They would rather pay someone like myself who's done it many times to do it in a much shorter period and then ensure that a lot of the right things are getting factored into the, into the study rather than spending a bunch of their own time trying to develop these models. And then also eventually there does come a point where certain buyers might want that third-party verification where they might not trust the results coming from a company because you could argue that they're biased to make their technology look good. And so there is some of that value in the third-party verification, but it's also tricky because, well, if the company is paying you, then, then the incentives can get a, a little strange. So sometimes it's the buyer or the investor who wants to sponsor the study and understand, okay, is this something that we should invest in? And as I mentioned, often these studies are going on in, in the academic world too. And so there's professors who just pump these studies out uh, as, as their research. And that's, that's just what they do. And that's kind of the function. Uh, and sometimes those are sponsored, sometimes they're not. And yeah, that just kind of adds more value to the assessment world. I have a follow-up question, but I'm going to uh, pause it and we'll see if we have time for it because I want I don't want to run out of time before uh, the the end of the hour before I get into some of these questions that have come in, in from the uh, from the audience. So the I'm going to read the first question from Sarmad, which is a lot of new CDR technologies are unique. How do you see the LCA being used in development standards that can be used in certifying actual carbon removal that takes place? So this also ties into the MRV or the measurement or monitoring or reporting and verification work that's that's going on. And LCA, I kind of view as a subset of that that exists in that uh, measurement and, and maybe a little bit of the reporting step, but also LCA conceptually looks a little more at the supply chain of the technology to ensure that all things, you know, all material, energy considered, equipment, is it actually removing carbon? But then the MRV is often focusing on the, is the carbon actually being sequestered underground permanently? How do we know? How can we verify that? How can we increase confidence for customers? And those are related, but different. And really both are necessary to ensure that, again, we're actually removing carbon. So LCA is part of that, and, and it's the foundation. You may notice that in some legislation, um, like in the IRA life cycle assessment or greenhouse gas assessment, those phrases will appear. And at the, in the high level legislation, it will say, oh, the regulators like the EPA, for example, or the Department of Energy, they'll work more on developing standards that technologies will need to abide by in order to qualify for these tax credits. And often doing LCA according to some set of standards is an important part of that. And so, yeah, it's, it's also increasingly being required by certain buyers. Like I mentioned, Frontier and XPRIZE, LCA is kind of a fundamental part of, of their evaluation processes to ensure that uh, carbon removal is taking place and, and, and that they are, that companies submitting are viable candidates for, for that funding. So it's, it's definitely a kind of a key piece of, of developing those standards, but it's not the only piece. Uh, so I have another question here from Devin, which uh, he says, I have a trickier question, so brace yourself. Uh, when talking to policymakers who want to make public investments in CDR, they fix on the dollars per ton uh, CO2 for better or worse. And sometimes they want to know the ROI, return on investment, uh, on the innovation slash learning, et cetera, derived from a project. Any good ideas on how to estimate one? That is kind of a tricky question. <laughs> Yeah. So the thing I'll start by saying is that I wrote this blog post on Naeem Merchant's Substack, The Carbon Curve, called Rapidly Reducing the Cost of Carbon Removal. And I would recommend checking into that for some more thoughts on learning by doing and research and development and innovation on, on how these costs come down over time. If I understand your question, uh, though, it, it seems that 
often the point of innovation and learning is to bring costs down. So like we want to invest in R&D so that we can bring costs down to make these processes more cost competitive. And so, yeah, from like the government's perspective, they have this fixed amount of money that Congress has allowed them to spend on these different processes. Uh, although I think there are some uncapped tax credits like 45Q for, for carbon removal. Um, although you should fact check that. And um, in those cases, yeah, like from the government's perspective, they're going to want to spend that money as effectively as possible so that they can get their most bang for their buck and get costs down as, as quickly as possible. And that is just subject to the program managers and the offices that are deploying that funding. I'm sure they, I would hope that they have different cost effectiveness models that they're using to figure out which technologies can benefit the most from this funding. It gets funky because you want to reward technologies that are doing well, but you may also want to use the funding for technologies that need it more. So that's something to, to consider. Um, yeah, so I don't know. I, I don't know if that answers the question or not, but um, it is a tricky question. I posted the yeah. link to your uh, Substack uh, article on uh, carbon curve in the chat, so uh, please check that out. Um, I'm also, uh, if you're watching the recording, I'm hopefully going to remember to put this into the uh, summary, uh, the the description of the this as well. But if I haven't, uh, contact me and I'll I'll put it in there uh, later, so you can check out that article as well uh, to uh, to get more information. Uh, Devin says thanks. So I, it seems like maybe you did answer the question. <laughs> Uh, to Devin's satisfaction. Uh, I think that's all the time we have for today. I uh, really appreciate everybody coming out. Uh, be sure to come back next week uh, when we have uh, next week is Gloria, I believe, um, mm -hmm. with office hours. Uh, so there might be not be a recording for that if you're watching the recording, uh, but office hours on uh, sort of hardware design and development uh, for your project. So uh, we will see you then, and uh, hopefully uh, you will get more content uh, from our newsletter. And uh, thank you again to Grant for such an awesome session, and uh, appreciate your time. Yeah, thanks, everyone. <laughs>